Good morning or good afternoon, depending on where you are at. My name is uh, Atarot Aziz Inamini, director of the ABC UTC at Florida International University. Um, before we start the webinar, the 2022 International ABC Conference is coming fast. Not, it's going to be just a couple of months from now in December, between December 7 and 9 in Miami, Florida. Day before the conference starts, we also have the several uh, workshops. This workshop is not just about the ABC. These workshops are for design of the steel, concrete, and FRP bridges using the Ashto LRFT. So um, if this is a very good opportunity if you want to uh, refresh your, basically the uh, knowledge about the use of the Ashto LRFT code, for design of the bridges, whether steel, concrete, or FRP. This is a very good opportunity. So there's going to be uh, the, the several of them in addition to the workshop on the UHPC. Um, as an example, for example, here you see the, the workshop on the design of the FRP uh, bridges, uh, several presentations, several designs, uh, the, the complete design of it, for example, let's say design of FRP bridge tub is going to be presented, um, light with prefabricated cantilever sidewalks, and also uh, we have uh, John Busell with us, uh, who is going to give the overview of the FRP bridge application, the, the history of it. So it's a very interesting, actually, presentation. Uh, we have almost 40 uh, companies that, are, that have actually uh, reserved their boots, and they're going to be there. But still, there are some additional boots available for exhibit. So if you if you interested to showcase your um, products, solutions, company, uh, what what you do, this is a very good opportunity. So hope to see you in Miami, Florida. Our presentation today features the California Department of Transportation's 21st Avenue Bridge Replacement Project. We're pleased to welcome our presenter, David Carlin, Structure Representative and Structure construction unit 3665 at Caltrans. We'd like to also introduce our Q&A session moderators, Paul Lyles, formerly Georgia State Bridge Engineer, and Jugesh Kapoor with WSP USA and formerly State Bridge Engineer at WashDOT. We'll now begin our featured presentation. Dave? Okay, thank you, Mary Lou. Uh, again, my name is Dave Carlin. I am a structure representative with the Caltrans California Department of Transportation. I work in the Division of Engineering Services, specifically in structures construction. As such, I've had the opportunity to participate in the delivery of several of our recent ABC projects. And today, I'm going to take advantage of this opportunity to kind of talk through the development and execution of one of those recent successes. So, with that, I will begin our presentation. The 21st Avenue Undercrossing. Identify and implement. So this was a complete superstructure replacement on State Route 99 that took place utilizing a 100-hour full freeway closure. Now the technical term for this type of slide is extremely busy. I did that uh, somewhat deliberately to try and give uh, an impression of just how many partners and high-level partners and stakeholders were either impacted or directly involved in the development of this uh, contract package. As you can see, there are three specific branches within Caltrans, uh, being our District 3 design team, the Caltrans Accelerated Bridge Construction Team, as well as Structures Construction, and a number of high-level municipal partners, including the cities of Sacramento, Elk Grove, Stockton, uh, and several others that there just wasn't real estate to fit. Now, with regards to project stats that I think will impact kind of the perception of some of these slides, you can see this project was initially advertised in October of 2020, including some addendum uh, period or addendum delays associated with the bid period. We were still able to execute an approval on December 17th of that year. The contract was set up with 25 working days, um, and based on the contractor's elected schedule, the first working day was in May of 21. Our ultimate closure duration that facilitated the work we're going to go through was 96 hours. Uh, engineers estimate at time of bid was just over 5 million. Uh, we received a low bid of right at 3.5 million with a second low bid uh, right there at the same number. 
including construction phase changes and ancillary costs, we ended up with a total project cost of approximately 4.35 million. And I'd like to point out here at the bottom of the screen, Bridgeway Civil Constructors was our prime contractor for the contract. Um, and you'll see their logo throughout. So to give some idea of where the project took place, uh, California, um, our DOT divides the state into 12 districts. Uh, we as District 3, you can see here in kind of the northern portion of the state, have a territory that abuts the San Francisco Bay Area and extends all the way to the Nevada border, kind of right in the Lake Tahoe region. Zooming in a bit, we can see kind of the central focus of that region is this, State Route 99. Now this is a remnant of what once was US 99, spanning from the California-Mexico border to Canada in the north. Uh, what remains is approximately 400 miles of highly trafficked corridor uh, with a southerly terminus at the Los Angeles grapevine and a northerly end a couple hours north of Sacramento in the city of Red Bluff. Um, orienting ourselves relative to some common kind of uh, waypoints, you have San Francisco here to the west. Uh, apparently they have a bridge as well and a, and a baseball team. Uh, to the south, we've got a highly dense agricultural zone that I've represented here with my favorite, the California Avocado Commission. Uh, centered about the project site, we have the Port of West Sacramento, the Port of Stockton, and then of course, uh, the central hub, the city of Sacramento. Zooming in a bit more, we can see how the 99 relates and is situated relative to that commercial hub that is Midtown Sacramento and the capital. Um, to the south, we have high density residential zones, including the cities of Elk Grove, Lodi, Stockton, and the surrounding communities. And as I mentioned, the ports of Stockton and West Sacramento. Uh, the port of Stockton does nearly 400 or 4 million tons of cargo annually. Um, and if you've eaten sushi rice or poured with Portland cement concrete from Semex on the West Coast, you've probably managed goods that came through the port of West Sacramento. Uh, the combination of this commuter and commercial traffic results, and this is as far back as 2019, an ADT in excess of 220,000 vehicles. Um, based on the recent commercial expansion, as well as kind of the housing crisis that I'm sure you've heard of in California, we expect that number, even in light of stay at home and work from home protocols, to have expanded substantially. At the street level, we can see that our site, the 21st Avenue Undercrossing, is one of only two potential pedestrian crossings uh, linking the communities of Oak Ridge and North City Farms. Uh, it's located centrally between um, Oak Ridge, North City Farms to the east, and two major highway crossings. Um, at the street level, you can see we have residential sidewalks and residential properties that directly abut the department right away. Um, for these reasons and the fact that it links a primarily residential zone to the east and a commercial parallel corridor to the west, uh, this undercrossing sees both foot, bicycle, and vehicle traffic in both directions 24 hours a day. So what we had, the existing 21st Avenue undercrossing supported 10 full lanes of traffic, uh, five northbound, five southbound. Uh, and it was isolated from the surrounding community by continuous sound walls. Uh, these sound walls had been added by a previous uh, retrofit project. We had over 60 years of accumulated damage, uh, the associated repairs, as well as retrofit. The bridge itself spanned just over 51 feet, uh, normal to the abutment center lines, and had a total width perpendicular to mainline of just under 140 feet. Uh, that translates to a pedestrian cor corridor or undercrossing center line width of over 151 feet. Uh, and again, here I'd like to highlight the fact that the DOT right away directly abuts residential units right up to the property line. What that all translates to, as you can see, very little room to operate. Now, structurally, the existing structure consisted of two cast-in-place bridges originally constructed in 1959. Uh, these are represented here in orange. In 1974, a retrofit project 
um, consisting of a cast in place post tension voided slab on cantilever abutments was installed to increase the overall capacity of the corridor. Subsequent projects in 1983 and later served to add the previously mentioned sound walls as well as replace the original exterior and medium barriers and address the periodic maintenance issues that were discovered and documented by the department's structure maintenance and investigations unit. So project need. Uh, I don't expect you to be able to read the fine print of this document, but what I wanted to demonstrate is that this bridge was part of the department's inventory and therefore subject to biannual investigations, um, basically top down conducted by engineers to assess the performance of the structures under their uh, applicable load scenarios. These inspections through the 60s, 70s, uh, majority of the 80s and actually into the early 90s uh, indicated and documented issues typical of such a high traffic facility. Uh, those generally involve joint seal replacements, required header repairs, and some isolated spot repair of the wearing surface. Now throughout this period, the substructure and underside of the bridge remained in excellent condition. And with increased traffic as well as just general performance age, in the early to mid 2000s, the noted issues began to increase in severity and began to include more substantial wear indicators like exposed and degraded surface aggregates, longitudinal crack propagation, um, more rapid deterioration of the joints and joint repairs, as well as some evidence of water leaching into the original voided slabs. I think that can best be summarized here in 2006 by a formal notation from the maintenance and investigations unit that the overall condition of the deck has deteriorated significantly over the past several inspections and then the resulting determination which was an increased monitoring and investigation protocol. The result of that was a contract issued by the department in third quarter of, of 2010 executed in October of that year which included the removal and replacement of unsound deck material, a polyester overlay, as well as a more substantial joint replacement. You can see in this photo, this is in the southbound direction. This is where the construction management team has marked out areas where there was evidence of delamination. Uh, this was a result of a chaining or sounding operation. This location is significant because it coincides with the longitudinal joint between what was the original voided slab structure, traditionally reinforced, and the infill bridge in this zone, which was the post-tensioned cast in place. In February of 2011, following completion of this contract, a non-routine inspection identified heavy delamination in this same zone, and that indicated that there was still differential movement as well as prob the probability of more likely delamination in the underlying reinforced core of the deck. At this point, SM&I made the first recommendation um, for a potential retrofit project consisting of a deck on deck to address the noted deficiencies, which were at this time isolated to the superstructure. So as I mentioned, SMNI's recommendation of a deck on deck, and that would have relied on a dowel connected reinforced slab, originally estimated at an approximate four inch depth. That would have increased the dead load. It would have required lengthy AC conforms uh, to complete the work, therefore adjusting the mainline profile, as well as multi-stage construction that whole approach would have relied on adequacy of the existing superstructure. ABC candidacy. The department operates under and maintains an accelerated bridge construction manual that guides project teams through the refinement of their designs and selection of applicable ABC uh, methodologies. In this particular case, the PDT in meeting with the district as well as project stakeholders was provided information before they even implemented uh, the design flow protocols outlined in the manual. Some of the key things that were discussed included limitation of lane closures to only nights and weekends, uh, the requirement to maintain a minimum of three lanes of traffic in each direction at all times, uh, the length and complexity of the associated pedestrian and bicycle detours required to support the work, the anticipated significant economic impact of performing the work under traditional means and methods, as well as the requirement for significant lengths of work directly adjacent to live traffic lines. 
So this was the epitome of an easy decision. The use of ABC processes in this regard increased the safety of the project, would significantly reduce the economic impact, it would de decrease the duration of the work and impacts, it would hopefully cultivate a positive community perception, and it would provide an excellent opportunity for the department to continue with their skills refinement, specifically ABC implementation. As the PDT moved into the type selection phase, uh, they were faced with the same primary questions that all of our teams are, which is what is the process that most directly suits the site? Uh, in this case, one of the options explored was the lateral slide, uh, which was ruled out due to the lack of suitable real estate in the vicinity of the project. Uh, local vendor capability. Under this pretense, precast deck panels were ruled out due to the significant logistics hurdles associated with transport and staging them, as well as the likely reduction in the number of local casting yards that were capable of producing them. Our team worked to identify and address challenges typical of this type of construction, uh, as well as department experience, and leaned heavily on the slower right photo and the project where it was taken, the completed Echo Summit Side Hill Viaduct project completed in 2020. So the question, how can we utilize and expand on our existing ABC toolbox? In this case, we looked at that recent success, the Echo Summit Side Hill project, and realized that if we were capable as a department of working with our contractors to hang off the side of a mountain and perform a complete structure replacement utilizing the UHPC and precast girder complemented team, that that might be the route to go for this particular project. The PDT selected a compact precast pre-stressed box girder as the superstructure method. They determined that ultra high performance joints uh, provided se several logistical advantage uh, in part due to their successful implementation on those recent projects as well as simplification of the construction phase. Uh, we implemented extensive contractual pre-construction requirements based on recent experience and feedback provided by local vendors. We utilized an incentivized 100 hour full, uh, full closure of State Route 99 to complete the work. And lastly, we developed and implemented in companionship with the contractor, a comprehensive public outreach and education campaign. So with regards to the details specific to this location, um, as you can see here, what had started out as a generally typical crowned profile through the project corridor over those decades of retrofit um, we have this rather irregular super transition zone, and that drove the way that a lot of the construction was completed, as well as the design selection. The project design team selected the use of 33 identical interior girders coming in at just over 43,000 pounds apiece, and two unique exterior girders inclusive of their barrier. Um, so this totals 34 longitudinal ultra high performance joints that needed to be constructed. As you can see, the superstructure had a constant uniform depth of two foot three inches. Our interior girders were constructed at a four foot width and the exteriors just slightly under at a width of three foot 10. The ultra high performance joints that were used is a relatively standard joint detail, although it was slightly modified based on contractor and vendor input uh, gained at the Echo Summit project. Uh, we utilized a six inch total width with a one and a half inch throat uh, to facilitate introduction of the UHPC. Uh, we used an exposed aggregate finishing to ensure an adequate shear bond and bond between the UHPC and the concrete. And then a number five dowels at four inches on center. In terms of utilization of the existing substructure, um, the existing abutment seats afforded 12 inches of bearing width and the design concept based on a three inch extension using rapid strength concrete, as well as shear dowels through the heart of each girder. And the selection of the precast box girder was made based on several criteria. As I mentioned, these were readily available and afforded the, the project both fabricator and contractor familiarity. They provided easier transport as well as facilitated multiple options in terms of rigging and installation. 
Um, they capitalized on the proven success of ultra high performance joints. Uh, they would not require a separate deck pour, which would be difficult to oversee and also very impactful to our total closure duration. And lastly, they would accommodate the requirement of maintaining the as-built roadway and abutment cross sections. The ultra high performance joint methodology itself was selected based on proven service durability. Uh, the department leaned heavily on its experience gained on recent projects, as well as through coordination with the ABC UTC organization. It afforded decreased girder complexity, which for these girders at a 50 foot length, weight was not necessarily a concern. However, in larger scale operations similar to Echo Summit, uh, the elimination of interior diaphragms um, can come into play, especially with regards to transportation and hoisting. And as I mentioned, these afforded construction phase efficiency by the key operations being conducted from the top down and not requiring a separate deck forming and placing operation. Uh, for this contract, we selected a sole source provider, which was the Lafarge Wholesome Ductile JS1212 product. We relied on the maturity method, uh, which was supported by several pre-construction uh, contractual submittals. Uh, in order to determine strength at time of opening. Our contractor utilized GIA Tech's Smart Rock 3 wireless app-based performance monitoring system, which allowed us to monitor in real time uh, at multiple locations in each one of the joints during the cure process. Uh, we based our trial slabs as well as our production installation on a 120 degree target temperature uh, utilizing forced air curing tents in the field. And the contractor submitted and implemented both vibration and relative displacement prevention protocols uh, that we'll discuss on a further slide. I mentioned the enhanced pre-construction requirements that were incorporated into this contract. Um, as an agency, this has been one of the most significant kind of implementations of lessons learned. For this contract, um, there was the typical ultra high performance mixed design pre-qualification. Um, that included submittal and discussion of the strength maturity curve development process and the resulting data points. Uh, we did a full-scale joint mock-up and trial that allowed the contractor to train their personnel as well as refine the means and methods used for that process. And perhaps one of the biggest and most impactful changes, as you can see here in this lower left photo, was a full-scale girder pre-assembly and test fit. Um, this was a direct result of issues that were encountered on the Echo Summit project and eliminated many of the construction phase concerns that the CM team had. The use of a, a full freeway closure was purely necessitated by the, the impacts that we discussed earlier for closure, um, whether it be lanes or segments of this corridor. Um, Caltrans utilized their internal public information office to design and then implement a far-reaching and comprehensive campaign. Some of the key things that were utilized um, were a focus on the public's singular event perception. Um, by utilizing the single closure and advertising it as such, um, the intent and actually the, the effect was that the public understood that the department was going to great lengths to reduce those impacts and it's kind of stimulated an interest and generous or curiosity in the public. Uh, the 100 hour duration that was selected for the contract requirement was based on industry input and a cost benefit analysis, um, basically trying to determine an appropriate level of aggressiveness for the contractor. Based on outreach with the project stakeholders, the contract identified a June 9th to August 11th work window, and that took into consideration uh, typical fluctuations in traffic volume associated with peak commute times, uh, school commutes, as well as some of the premier events that take place in Sacramento and the surrounding area. Uh, the contract via addendum included incentivization for early completion, um, and those were based on both scope and time deadlines that were included during bid phase um, and in, accounted for in contractor bids. And lastly, there were liquidated damages um, that broken down into 10 minute periods for late opening of lanes. These were something that were discussed at length during required pre-bid meetings to ensure that contractors understood the significance 
of traffic impacts relative to their bids and overall execution of the contract concept. The public outreach and education campaign utilized a multifaceted approach. And I know this is something that a lot of agencies are working to refine currently. Um, our team ut utilized a combination of community meetings conducted at or near the project site, uh, focused streaming media campaigns. Uh, those actually utilized a newer concept of geofencing to ensure that traveling public, even long haul truckers, people potentially traveling through the corridor that don't use it on a daily basis, would receive targeted messaging once they entered the selected geographical limits for those messages. Um, the entire campaign was conducted concurrently in English and Spanish uh, to ensure that the different community centers were adequately informed and felt involved in the decision-making process. And one of the unique strategies we implemented was the use of free mass transit with our local partners, including SACRT, uh, to both advertise their services and minimize the impact of the construction phase. So here are some examples of how that campaign looked as it was outgoing. We had the Fix SAC 99 campaign that advertised the free use of the local light rail. We had targeted campaigns on all of our local news providers that demonstrated where the potential traffic impacts would be and what the likely detours were. And then we had consistent advertisement of what appropriate reroutes or detours would be depending on which neighborhood the traveler was leaving from. So the lead up, hopefully if you caught on to the emphasis on how much was taken in terms of liability from the construction phase and shifted ahead. Um, there were 71 unique contractor submittals that were required to be reviewed and authorized prior to start. Uh, we utilized 120 day delayed start period to, to account for that. Um, all available preparatory scope, whether it be saw cutting, um, pre-installation of bracketry, staging of materials was all completed ahead of the closure. All equipment and materials were procured, delivered, staged, and authorized by department staff to the extent possible prior to use in the work. And then from the staff perspective, we developed a comprehensive staffing plan that ensured adequate overlap and that the appropriate staff would be on site at all times. So with that, I'll kind of summarize how things went during the, the four day closure. Uh, mobilization took place on June 12th, and the initial event, as you can see here, was installation of a temporary abutment lateral bracing scheme. The original abutments were strutted, therefore relying on the superstructure for their lateral stability. Um, the contractor designed this system using typical false work pipe posts. Um, this was installed ahead of demo. You can see in the back, the slotted existing voided deck being removed in essentially panels. Uh, the contractor elected to perform initial breakdown and processing of the material on site to facilitate easier trucking. Uh, you can see here workers beginning to install along the lower portion a catwalk that facilitated required extension of the abutment seat. Uh, here's a better view of that existing uh, abutment seat showing the notch that was going to be filled to provide a full 15 inches of girder bearing. And here we are near the end of day one, showing the completed demolition, as well as forms in place for a construction phase determined. Um, I myself performed the survey and calculated, uh, but we did uh, a seat extension to ensure that we weren't introducing any rack to the girders in place. Day two, June 13th, we see the contractor here pouring those rapid strength concrete seat extensions ahead of girder installation. And here we are, two cranes in unison, working from the center out, placing our girders. Um, this was an advantage of doing the pre-girder fit up in that all girders had a designated location and any inconsistency due to casting tolerances or, or deformation during curing could be accounted for. On day two, here we see the beginning of the UHPC placement process. Um, I think anyone who's worked with UHPC has probably seen these motorized buggies uh, and some of the typical details, including the joint caps, uh, the head cups, uh, to ensure that we maintain positive head pressure and, and avoid any possible voids under those covers. And extending into the night. Um, 
operation was completed on day two for the placement of all available U UHPC. And I'll discuss, you can see here, one joint incompleted. Uh, one of the construction phase, um, we'll say, challenges that was addressed during this process. Day three started off with completion of the cure time. Uh, you can see some of the forced air cure tents still in place here. Uh, the crew immediately went in. We have an army here using the scabbers to grind the deck smooth in preparation for the installation of poly. Uh, this bridge received a nominal one inch thickness polyester overlay as part of the contract design. You can see here concurrent with the final stage of curing, uh, all the AC grinding took place and crews here removing the remnants of the cure tents as well as all the grindings associated with that. And lastly, day three, AC pavement taking place. And this was one of the construction phasing challenges, the necessity for placement of the AC overlay prior to the polyester overlay. So we had calculated a required thickness that accounted for the roadway cross section uh, and ensured that we hit those numbers as this mat was placed. June 15th, uh, the home stretch. You can see here the completion of that AC paving process. Polyester overlay, uh, a combination of both machine paving and hand paving to account for the variable roadway cross section um, and into the shoulders. Here we are, a completed roadway uh, with the median 60 barrier. This is an enhanced uh, initiative throughout the state with this five foot tall median barrier. And just ahead of the 96 hour mark, uh, striping going into place. So this slide, uh, as basic as it is, I thought was critical to include for this instance. Quite often our ABC projects are, um, I'll say flashy for lack of a better term. And this I thought as a project was a great example of kind of a utilitarian application of these techniques. Uh, the point of this project from the public's perspective was to make it seem as though it hadn't happened. And if you were not someone who commuted on Monday and Tuesday, when you went to work on Wednesday, this is what you experienced. Basically the same roadway that you had before with no impacts to your daily commute. I'll point out here in just a moment how we have the shoulders isolated and that was to account for a construction phase challenge uh, that's typical of the type of things we encounter with these operations. So calling audibles. How as an agency or construction management team in partnership with the designers can we prepare ourselves to handle the issues that we know are possible? We can take advantage of in-depth pre-construction meetings that involve the experts, that involve the contractors that are going to be performing the work. Um, we can perform independent department and contractor investigations to either verify things that are shown in the plans or to potentially identify things that could result in time savings or present issues during construction. Uh, we can prepare workarounds in advance of the work that address those types of issues that are either potential or anticipated. Um, it's something we took advantage of and we strongly recommend as an agency is full-time design representation and support. And this was a combination of staff at their workstations at the office, as well as staff on site. Um, and speaking from the construction management perspective, uh, to know that I was supported in real time to implement changes that I thought were appropriate um, was a tremendous asset. An assignment of authority. At all times on this contract, there was a design representative, a construction representative, as well as a district or roadway and traffic representative on site with the authority uh, to provide concurrence or provide input to address any challenges that came about. Some of the things we dealt with on this particular project. So uh, the design concept was to maintain the existing roadway geometry and provide a more significant bearing surface using this three inch by three inch extension of the existing abutment seat and a minimal leveling course. Now prior to construction, 
it was identified through a pre-construction meeting that that was contingent on the existing superstructure being consistent with the, with the two foot three inch dimension of our new girders. So this is a basic plot of cores that were done in combination between the contractor and the department's uh, field investigation team to verify those dimensions. The result of that was confirmation that in some sections, specifically in the infill bridge, the existing superstructure exceeded the two foot three by up to an additional five inches. So based on that, in working with the team, we cored the existing abutment diaphragms and confirmed the issue. We identified the likely need for a more significant abutment seat extension and coordinated with the contractor to procure and stage additional material to manage that. Um, at the time of initial closure, we performed as-built survey and then surveyed again concurrent with the demolition process. And then we rolled that into what was pre-prepared, basically a basic spreadsheet that would allow us to determine real-time abutment centerline profiles and the relative difference between the northerly and southerly ends of each girder. And that allowed us to ensure that we could provide fills to the contractor, understand what our final roadway cross section would be and how that related to the mainline profile and what the resulting twist or differential grade or cross section of the girder ends would be. The UHPC burn rate. Um, these contracts are structured such the, that the contractor determines the order quantity for that material. And obviously that's based on the dimensions of the, the planned joints. Um, something that the contractor is responsible for is determining cumulative tolerances. Now those can be a result of either the casting process, uh, irregularity, it gets down to the level of detail of like the exposed aggregate texture, um, differential movement during the cure time, um, as well as field fit up and conforming to the roadway cross section at time of placement. Um, that would be considered one of the field fitment issues that we dealt with. Uh, girder joint leakage, which we'll talk about in our lessons learned and looking forward, but this was a quantity that was difficult to determine ahead of time and ended up impacting the overall installation process. And lastly, the forming system weight, another finite volume that can be determined in advance uh, that plays critically into the procurement of material. You can see here, these were the negotiated rates since we had a sole source product that were provided to the bidding contractors for determination of their total bid amounts. So looking at just under $4,000 per cubic yard uh, for that ductile JS1212 product. The way that this issue came about during construction was one of our ABC specialists um, who had been observing the operation since it began just after 2 p.m. Uh, was performing back of the napkin takeoffs of utilization or SAC utilization per joint, basically doing a rough number projection. Um, she raised a question about the remaining quantity. Uh, that was done just after about 5.30 p.m. By 5.45, we had done a more detailed analysis and come up with an as-built placing rate and confirmed that there was a projected shortage of that material. By 1800 or six o'clock p.m., in working with the traffic staff that were on site as well as the designer, we were able to come up with an alternate placing sequence and directed the contractor to change the order in which they were pursuing filling the joints and basically isolate the shoulders for completion at a later date. And while this wasn't ideal, what it allowed the department to do was uphold our commitment to the traveling public while concurrently providing a safe means and methods for reopening to full traffic and facilitating the work at a later date. The as-built girder bearing, um, as I mentioned, was the premise was that we would provide this three inch by three inch extension for a full one foot three inches of bearing width. Now, as the demolition took place, it was determined that there was some variance and that we would not be achieving the full 15 inch seat width. We were able to install at the per plan location the shear pins. However, we identified that there was a rearward batter to the existing abutments. And it's likely due to the fact that the initial northbound and southbound bridges were strutted and the retrofit was on cantilevered abutments. Um, this resulted in inconsistent girder spans um, and corresponding incons inconsistent bearing lengths. 
So a real-time design investigation was launched when this was identified. We had performed as-built measurements of the bearing widths and working in tandem with the designers on site determined that we could do a retrofit project immediately following reopening, essentially a cast in place, dowelled and bonded corbel to provide the required bearing width. And this is a result as a department, we have a more conservative minimum bearing width um, for seismic performance than when this bridge was originally constructed. And again, this is an example of how working in tandem with full-time on-site design representation allows us to meet our commitments to the traveling public while still providing a safe structure and a means to correcting the issue at a later date. The aftermath. I thought it was important to share this slide because this kind of summarizes the experience of one of these incentivized closures from the construction management and field design engineer perspective. Um, you can count on the trucks looking like this. This is not the contractor. This is actually the engineer in responsible charge for this bridge. Um, everything from real-time survey to tried and true string line layout of abutment seat elevations. Um, this is one of the greatest potential events for applying kind of nuts and bolts engineering um, in a fast paced environment. And I think we all pretty much felt like this personified at the end of the 100 hours. So looking ahead and lessons learned from this and other recent projects, um, Caltrans intent is to continue the refinement and, and refining the implementation and use of our ABC construction manual. Um, we do that by coordinating meetings post-construction that include the ABC specialists as, as, as well as everyone from the team, from the PR all the way down to the field inspectors and selected members of the contractor committee. Um, things that we're looking at specific to um, observations on this contract would be refinement and perhaps alternative ceiling mechanisms for the UHPC joints uh, that would better accommodate um, in situ variation between the girders and prevent any leakage, which compounds that material quantity projection issue. Um, along with that, perhaps a contractual requirement for as-built verification so that the types of things like that the coring revealed where the department feels it would be prudent to perform additional investigation or perhaps there's investigation specific to the contractor's proposed means and methods could be incorporated as contract requirements. And then from a construction management standpoint and agency standpoint, implementing an enhanced operation specific duration tracking mechanism. Uh, so much of the staff on this is required to be making technical decisions throughout. Um, and as we've navigated these projects, we've realized the value of having staff assigned specifically to observing the duration and basically overall implementation of specific construction phase processes. And with that, I'll conclude my presentation and turn it over to the team for the Q&A session. All right, thank you, Dave, for a, a very good and interesting presentation. At this point, uh, we're going to turn it to Paul Lyles and Jugish Kapoor, who are going to be moderating the question and answer period. Paul, it's all yours. Okay, thank you, Atorid. Dave, a really good, really interesting project. Uh, we had some questions that came in. Um, uh, beforehand, and then we've got some that have come in during your presentation. So we'll go ahead and get into them. We've broken them down a little bit into construction, uh, maybe, uh, excuse me, design, then construction, then a cost question or two. So anyway, uh, let's uh, go ahead and get, get with it. Uh, you want to introduce the rest of your team? Absolutely, yeah. I would like to introduce the staff that I have here supporting me today. This is some of the key members from the project team. In just one moment. So uh, Brandon Miller is one of our bridge construction engineers. He's responsible for a sizable portion of District 3, including Alpine regions surrounding Lake Tahoe. He actually was the engineer in charge at the construction level for both Echo Summit, Side Hill Viaduct, and the 21st Avenue undercrossing. Uh, Hogna Setberg, another one of our bridge construction engineers. The 21st Avenue undercrossing took place uh, under his team's purview. Um, he's been one of the main drivers of implementation of the ABC process here in our District 3. And Kuraswamy uh, Selvin, who was the design engineer for this project and is a senior design specialist in our ABC branch today. Okay, welcome everyone. Uh, the first question that I have here 
is uh, uh, going to be about uh, the how you engage the public, and it was this came in beforehand. Uh, how is the public engaged to, not um, to notify them of the work and its benefits to the adjacent community? You covered that pretty well in your slide, but another part of this question was uh, how were these lessons learned that you did when you went through the project uh, shared back to Caltrans, the uh, traffic handler? Well, I'll, I'll leave this one off, and I think, Selvin, you might be able to, to complement this a bit, but as a department, we benefit quite a bit from the fact that the ABC team, everyone from the, the design concept drivers to the engineers who complete those designs were fully participant throughout the construction phase. So we try to maintain open dialogue um, through kind of the final execution steps of the contract, through construction. And then that process remains for a considerable time after as the you know kind of the paperwork and closeout process goes on. So as things come to mind or refinements are identified, there's a direct pipeline to the team who would be responsible for incorporating those into future ABC implementations. Okay. Uh, we'll go on to another question. Uh, this is uh, more on the design part of it and it says, was any consideration of repair instead of replacement of this bridge uh, given, you covered that pretty well. You wanna comment on it, any, add anything to that? I think they have uh, covered it very well. Actually, the structure maintenance uh, tried to repair the bridge, but they found their repairs uh, didn't work out because uh, uh, the existing bridge condition was really bad. It's beyond a repairable stage. So that's why uh, we concluded to replace the superstructure. Okay. Uh, then there was another question. This is a new question that was kind of related to this. Did you give any consideration to maybe uh, using something that wouldn't have quite as many uh, longitudinal joints? So we, we spoke at length about this, and th there was one consideration to the not wanting to exclude any local vendors. Uh, if you look at the time period that this took place, that actually ended up being incredible foresight in light of the impacts of COVID for material availability. And you certainly don't want to exclude local vendors. But on top of that, we knew that we had a variable cross section and you lose a lot of your ability to accommodate imperfections in, in the existing abutment seats or trying to conform to that roadway profile when you go to a wider, like a precast deck panel method. Um, in this case, you, you really want to avoid having lengthy AC conforms required. Just the time and scope associated with that, it's not possible in a 100-hour closure. So the narrower joint width or the narrower girder width and the increased number of joints gave us more flexibility to match those conforms. Okay. Uh, is, we'll move over to the construction questions now. We got a number of those. And this one came in beforehand. And it's, uh, can you discuss the primary lessons learned on the project that would have made significant differences uh, if you had known it? Brandon, you want to tackle that one? Uh, sure, yeah, actually, um, doesn't exactly ask, answer your question that you're asking, but we did implement a whole lot of lessons learned from our Echo Summit project. So I think the only lessons learned that I would take forward um, would be um, in our Echo Summit project, we had plenty of lead up. In that project, we did the abutments, it is a complete new uh, structure. Uh, we did the abutments uh, a year in advance. So the crew was familiar with the, the location, the crew was familiar with each other. Um, there was a working relationship. In this case, it was basically get out there, close the road for four days, and come back out. So there was kind of like that. Um, um, familiarization that was missing and I I would say as far as an ABC uh, lessons learned for future projects that that's important um, you know having a little bit of lead up other than that honestly as Dave went over there was a lot of lessons learned that were that were gained from our echo summit project and I'm just grateful that we we're able to uh, to learn from that and use them okay um, here's a question that uh, came in earlier and then I'll elaborate there's a new one that came in I think uh, what were the safety considerations for such high ADT? You had greater than 220,000 vehicles a day. That's that's pretty big. So 
at the initial design selection phase and it as early as 2006 when SM and I had identified hey you know a deck on deck would be an approach for this and it's going to require AC conforms you're looking at a minimum of three construction stages in order to maintain the required number of through lanes or active through lanes so that immediately it was identified that basically the meat of this work is going to be carried out not only next to a live lane but a high density mixed commercial and commuter lane that does not slow down as daily commuter traffic subsides it gets picked up by commercial traffic taking advantage of the lower commuter count so ultimately and selvin you might be able to compound on this the, the driving force behind going to the abc aside from economic impact was how do we prevent the need for contractors and our staff to be working directly adjacent a live lane at this level of scope okay and then a new question that came in about that is how did you manage the traffic uh, uh, control during the bridge construction? So there was some traffic that uh, you had to route somewhere else. Uh, how, how did you do that? So the, the public information team working with our district had a clear handle on what the primary reroutes were. Um, they used, I mean, our, our campaign and our infrastructure using like our changeable message signs extended through four counties. So if you were attempting to commute out of San Francisco two hours to the west, you were seeing signage about our closure weeks to months out. Um, anybody on our kind of, I'll say our north-south primary corridors of the 5 and 99 that traveled that at any frequency was seeing those messages beforehand. And then depending on which region was served by which agency, the detours and reroutes that were most applicable to them were advertised through the local news channels and those geofence targeted streaming media campaigns. So we, we were striving both for consistency in the message, but also location and kind of demographic specific detours, reroutes and plans that would be most efficient for those groups that were targeted. Okay. Um, a new uh, question that came in beforehand was, uh, do you think there should be some change in contract structure? Uh, and, uh, uh, the pre-construction approach after completing the project you had it to do over again hogan would you like to tackle that one yeah i'll be glad to um in it, it worked out very well it was very successful but we had a couple of hiccups and uh, um, one was the uh, the seed extension that we had to do and the other one was the shortage of uhpc and i think some of those could have been avoided maybe with a different structure and not with a low bid uh, type of contract and so what i would like to see in the future is a trial of uh, cmgc where you bring the contractor on board during the development of the project uh, that just wasn't a possibility in our case because we were too far along in the contract by the time we decided to go with the 100 hour closure but if we could pre-plan it ahead that would be my choice okay good 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 comment uh, then uh there's a question here about, uh, this came in beforehand, is re regarding more design examples, do you have any uh, more similar projects scheduled or underway uh, at this time? I'm thinking in the Sacramento area. So, so I'm, gonna, I'm gonna go ahead and pull up the slide that was specific to the ECHO Summit. And then Selvin, that might be one that I think you could best answer. Does your team, where else are we looking to implement this currently? Uh, actually, there are uh, you know many uh, projects similar to this is going uh, um, around. Uh, basically, they are using the uh, adjacent box girders and the UHPC joints, but the nature is not exactly same. Um, but uh, you know, I don't have the full list of uh, the projects, but uh, we are keep on uh, doing this many in the district four, district one, and district two. I have been seeing. Uh, but, you know, our folks go and uh, look at the UHPC testing and implementation. So it's, uh, uh, but the full closure, you know, there are different type of uh, structures, uh, one or two have been done and we hope that we'll be doing more full, full closures like this uh, maybe coming up because this is a successful project. So okay. that helps to do more like this. Okay. Um... Here's a question that came in uh, uh, before we get to a cost question. This is construction still. Um, how would variable camber from girder to girder be handled? 
That's a, an excellent question. I can see Brandon smiling. So this was something that we dealt with and it was more, uh, I would say, amplified with the longer girders used like at Echo Summit, where you're looking at a hundred foot length. Um, you can run piano wire and you can check those for casting tolerances and resultant as-built camber. Um, and, and you may be within two hundredths. You can be as tight and as we are currently capable of technology-wise. But when you imagine setting those side by side, you're amplifying any of those differences out. By going to the narrower units, you're able to average out some of the differential camber. And from a design approach, from the get-go, it was known that we were gonna be applying a polyester concrete overlay. So as long as we created the, the structural sound joints and had our homogenous kind of superstructure unit, we could come in with the scabbers and the deck grinding afterwards, level out the remnants of the UHPC placement, and then create our smooth driving surface and accommodate any differential camber that came about of the casting process in the polyester. Now, for a longer bridge like Echo, um, that, that happened to be in an Alpine district, um, but there could be benefit to a larger planned ultra high performance or polyester overlay to have the potential to accommodate more differential. Uh, in this case, with a 50 foot girder, um, the one inch nominal that we used was sufficient in order to provide that smooth surface. Okay, now you did that sort of a full scale mock up and that would have told you maybe something was, if something was going on. And then uh, then you did the overlay too. So I think that kind of can't handle your problem there if there, if there was a problem. Correct. Uh, okay, uh, there's a couple more questions here then I'm gonna get uh, Jugash to pick up. Uh, um, how would, uh, let's see, please expand on the smart rock monitoring system used for the UHBC joint. Good. So I'll try and lead this off and then maybe Hogna, if you could, could add on a bit. But in order to implement the maturity method, you're looking at a two variables, you know, strength determination process. And so GIA smart rock allows you to embed the wireless sensor units and create a map of them ahead of time. So each joint, say it was joint one of 34, would have joint one A through G or however many were required at the spacing determined during the design phase. And then we could be looking at a real time map on our phones, anyone provided with the login credential to in real time, watch uh, the maturation process from a temperature perspective. And the app itself is preloaded with the results of the pre-qualification curve. So not only you're seeing a real-time sensor readout of temperature, you have the real-time readout of time, and based on the approved curve from the pre-qualification, you're reading it in strength. Okay. Yeah, I just that? wanted to add, Carl, Dave, uh, that um, we we checked that method during the pre-construction when we did the full-scale mock-up, and also confirmed the results with test with breaks, so that it all all was essentially calibrated. So we were very confident that the method would work when we used it. Okay, here's the question here. Uh, uh, how much schedule detail of the activities were required in advance of the shutdown? Brandon? Yeah, as far as scheduling of the activities, we were down to 15 minute increments for everything that occurred from all the different subcontractors doing demo to um, you know, the grinding, the paving, the, the everything that was involved. Um, so it was, uh, I think it's the first time I've seen a 15 minute breakdown. <laughs> so. Um, and how, how far in advance was the contractor required to submit that? Um, that's a good question. I'd have to get back to you on that one, but we did do on site meetings to discuss, you know, the durations and they were adjusted based on uh, meeting with uh, like the demo contractor on site, you know, to make sure they were realistic. We don't want somebody coming up with a schedule that uh, that their subcontractor can't meet. So we definitely um, uh, tuned it. Uh, so it was well in advance. I, okay. I don't remember there being a specific date for the advancement, but it had to be approved by us prior to starting the construction. So that started that collaboration. Okay. Um... I have a cost question here real quick. Uh, could you address cost of ABC versus conventional uh, design bid bill construction for the project? Selvin, would you be able to take that one? 
Yeah, uh, basically, you know, this um, projects uh, totally eliminated the conventional construction, so uh, we couldn't really compare the cost. Uh, but we had a uh, like three staging and two staging and full closure options. So finally, you know, we just um, looked at the difference between full closure versus three staging. And, um, you know, basically our, uh, the difference came about, you know, $100,000 savings from uh, construction as well as, you know, other maintenance activities that took place at the same time. But in reality, uh, the savings, are, uh, you know, the traffic impact is one of the major um, issue. Then uh, the loss of life or, you know, traffic accidents, those things are very difficult to measure. But uh, we know those have, uh, you know, bigger value than uh, the dollar amount. So, uh, you know, conceptually, we strongly believed that this short closure, you know, saved uh, a lot of um, uh, things that uh, we cannot put a dollar amount. Okay, uh, that's real good. It's uh, almost 10 after. I'm gonna ask Jugash to come in. There's a couple more questions that have come in and uh, Jugash uh, will uh, uh, finish it up. Jugash? Okay, thank you, Paul. So I'm gonna ask a few questions that came in during the webinar. First of all, can you expand on the acronym, acronyms PD PDT and SMNI. Yeah, so the PDT was the project development team. Um, so from the time that the need was identified, we pulled key members from the district or roadway side of things, from maintenance, from the innovation and ABC teams, as well as from construction to provide their input and kind of oversee and guide the contract and project development. And then SMNI is the department's structure maintenance and investigations unit. Um, it was their data and their reports throughout the decades that preceded the project that kind of documented and demonstrated the degradation of the existing structure. Okay, thank you. Next question. There is no concrete deck slab over the box beam. Is the box beam top flange as deck riding surface sufficient? I believe that's covered through the overlay, but you can maybe elaborate on that, the, the polyester overlay that you used. So, so they're asking there was nothing on the on the box beam but there is actually I'll, re, I'll repeat the question it's saying there is no concrete deck slab over the box beam is the box beam top flange as deck riding surface sufficient uh, the um, you know these uh, girders have adequate um, uh, top and uh, strength wise they are enough but for wearing surface, you know, we have applied the polyester concrete overlay that helps one for wearing and the other one is for to get a smooth uh, finish for riding. Okay, thank you. Next question, how much scheduled detail of the activities was required in advance of the shutdown? This one, I think we covered. Um, ultimately, what was decided upon and submitted and authorized, it was broken down into 15 minute increments. Um, the requirement contractually was for it to identify the logical sequence of work and break down each step into any sub, sub increments. Uh, that was approved at the discretion of the engineer as far as level of detail, if I'm not mistaken. Okay, thank you. Next question, was there any clear culprit or explanation for the shortage of the UHPC? <laughs> Next question. <laughs> now, the, <laughs> uh, I think the general consensus was that it was accumulation of uh, perhaps underestimation of the amount of material used during the trial, um, the, the preceding phases. Now that was quantified. It is anticipated that might have contributed. There's also some irregularity to the joints themselves, especially associated with achieving the exposed aggregate surface for the shear transfer and bond. Um, that along with any issues with fit up um, where one girder next to the other, if you're out by say two hundredths or a quarter of an inch, that applies to the full height of the theoretical joint. And when you're looking at that relative to 34 cumulative joints, um, you know, in the grand scheme, when we say that we were we underran, we're only talking about a couple of yards. It was not a, a significant quantity in terms of volume, but relative to the total usage, that's those are likely culprits. 
And that's where we're looking at maybe requiring a contractor submitted takeoff of the material used, um, anticipated, um, I guess, waste or excess, et cetera. Okay. I believe I've covered all the questions that came in. So I thank you very much and we'll turn it back to Adarod. All right. Thank you. Thanks to our speakers. Thanks to Mary Lou, Paul Lyles, and Jugish Kapoor to um, run the question and answer period. So this was a very informative presentation, Dave, and, and you're with your team. So we appreciate the time that you took and gave the presentation. And uh, on that note, we are going to uh, conclude uh, our September 2022 monthly webinar. We hope that uh, we will, uh, you will consider attending the 2022 ABC conference that is coming up in December uh, of this year in Miami, Florida. The conference is going to be held at Hyatt Regency Hotel in downtown Miami. If you plan to come, please consider to reserve your hotel rooms. Uh, we have blocks of uh, rooms at a special conference rates. December is a very busy time in Miami, Florida. So please uh, reserve your hotel room. And uh, if you plan to come, please register and take advantage of the early bird registration. On that, on that note, we will conclude and, uh, this webinar and hope to see you uh, in our next webinar. So long.